Episode 5, Q&A with the experts from the CCRG. You're listening to SpexCast. Hello and welcome to SpexCast, a podcast for discussing the science and technology of space exploration. I'm Phil and James is co-hosting with me today. Hi, James. Hello. In this episode, we'll be speaking with two real experts on gravity waves. Brennan Ireland. Hi. And Monica Rizzo. Hello. Brennan and Monica are researchers at the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation here at the Rochester Institute of Technology. The CCRG uses supercomputers to simulate astronomical phenomena and space-time itself, and the lab also develops open-source code in order to visualize the simulation data. Most recently, the lab has been in the news for their contributions to the discovery of gravitational waves. Brendan and Monica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks yeah. for having us. Okay, so to start things off, um, why don't you introduce yourselves and what you do at the CCRG? Brendan, why don't you go first? All right, sounds good. Uh, my name is Brendan Ireland. I am a third year PhD candidate with the Center for Computational Relativity and Gravitation here at RIT. Uh, my research focus is mainly around analytic models of binary black hole pairs. That sounds so, so cool. Yeah, so, wow. so what that means is that uh, I take different approximation techniques for black holes in a binary system and try and stitch them together mathematically. Uh, if you try and solve the binary black hole problem with the framework of general relativity, I bumped the mic. Don't worry. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. If you try and solve the binary black hole problem within the framework of general relativity, uh, you end up with this horrible set of equations that is almost impossible to solve. Uh, and for a binary black hole, it really is truly impossible. So you have to go to numerical techniques. Um, I am trying to avoid that by cheating. Oh, you're so cheating. I'm, I'm cheating. Well, okay. I, I don't actually solve the equations. Okay. I approximate them and then say that's probably so good So you said you take an equation that's this is how it is and you say well this is how we want it to be and then yeah you say, yeah so have uh have you guys taken calc 2 yet yeah. i'm actually taking project based one so i'm not there yet okay well uh you'll learn about taylor series which yeah. is a way to approximate a function uh that is basically all of physics as it turns out yeah is yeah. essentially taylor, engineering too <laughs> taylor approximations it's like well look this is how it works this isn't how we're going to do it we're going to taylor approximate it Take the function, expand it. That's essentially what we do. So Taylor series, for those that don't know, is any function can be represented by a summation. You sum up all the, it's like x over something plus x squared over something plus x cubed over something. And the way you can simplify things is by saying, well, the impact of the x to the fourths and x to the 18th is essentially zero. So we're just going to leave it out altogether and not worry about it. So over time, your error is pretty big but not enough to care yeah the the only thing i'd add there is that um the function has to be small the okay. thing that you're trying to approximate has to be something close to zero that way you can leave out these x to the big power right. terms so if you so. divide up space time into very small little uh segments well i uh, know we use time we use other we use other approximations so the okay. the trick the trick is actually um so, yeah, the, the problem is, like, you have to find uh, something that's very small. Uh, and when you're talking about relativity, you oftentimes don't have such an object because gravity is very strong, black holes are very massive. Right. Um, but you can kind of get away with a couple couple things. Uh, what we use is something called a slow motion approximation. That sounds awesome. So, <laughs> so slow, slow, motion, slow motion is not slow motion here on Earth. We're talking about still uh, fractions the speed of light, so something way faster than you could ever hope to achieve. Right. But 10% the speed of light is still 10%. Fast. So, <laughs> yeah, so if you're taking 10% cubed, you know, now you're at a much smaller, you know, one thousandth. Right. Of, okay. Uh, so your, your approximations can be okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, Monica, why don't you tell us your role at the CCRG? Um, okay, so I'm an undergraduate researcher at the CCRG. I'm only a second year. Um, but what I do is I work with binary neutron stars, which are oh, the other thing. so cool, too. <laughs> you get when big stars go supernova. Um, and specifically, what I do is I work on parameter estimation models for, um, for binary neutron stars. So, like, uh, you know how we saw a gravitational wave signal yeah. and somehow we determined that it was this mass. Right. Uh, that's what I do, but for neutron stars. Okay. And um, 
So neutron stars, they're very, very small stars, right? Yeah, so, so the thing about neutron stars is unlike black holes, they're composed of matter. So right. we don't really know as much about them. Like, we don't really know what they're made of. We call them neutron stars, but past, like, the very surface, they're not actually neutrons. There's some... Uh, something we we can't we can't really tell because they're sure. really dense nuclear matter right and they're not okay. very bright either so we can't observe them from great distances is that right or um, are they bright they can be very bright actually um yeah. oftentimes if they're rotating very rapidly oh, it's a quasar right no that's called a pulsar pulsar Quas- i was close yeah <laughs> pulsar Qua- quasar is a, an active black hole uh, i was uh, way up <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay it's, it is it is actually pretty close so, so a pulsar, a pulsar is a very rapidly spinning neutron star. Um, if it's off axis, you get well. Nobody can see my hands, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it, think about it kind of like a lighthouse, right? So, yeah. if the neutron star is spinning, it creates this beam of very, very um, tightly collimated photons and, and particles. Right. And that beam is directionally pointed in some right. direction. And so, if the star is spinning, you can get this lighthouse effect where the beam whips around. And every time you see a Wow. Yeah, so so the detector is somewhere out far away from us and if I hold if you hold your hand out and you turn around at some point in that circle that you turn there's the detector so you get these clicks. Yeah. So pulsars uh, oftentimes show up as just these very 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 accurate clicks. Accurate why? Because they're so consistent. They're extremely consistent. They have a lot, a lot of mass. And how uh, many times does this um, beam of light come around? Is it going very, very fast or is it every so often? They can be, uh, some of them are, oh man, okay, I got to make sure I get this right. Yeah, milliseconds. Wow. Like on that that level, millisecond pulsars are pretty common. It depends. You can, I think millisecond pulsars are about as common as they get though. Okay. So Brendan, you use numerical approximations for your research. Monica, how do you... How do you estimate these parameters, especially without direct observations? I mean, that's yeah. is that the point of the research is to figure that out? Um, so it's all theoretical right now. Yeah. Like we don't have any neutron star gravitational wave signals, but um, uh, the the models I work with right now are purely analytical. So basically, what he does, Taylor series okay. approximations, um, and um, actually, I'm starting a new project that involves um, like particle hydrodynamics so you, you simulate the neutron star as a ball of particles hmm. and it's a little more intricate a little more accurate but um, yeah sounds very complicated it's pretty cool <laughs> yeah so um if you could describe gravitational waves as a expert what would you say if you had to describe gravitational waves they're waves in gravity <laughs> <laughs> well okay so it's a uh <laughs> This is, of course, a cheating, a cheating explanation. This is it's a vacuum perturbation to um, Minkowski spacetime, which means absolutely nothing. Ah, uh, yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, a yeah, I know that. Great, great. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great explanation, and now that means absolutely but nothing. That's very specific. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a it's a very specific term. It's the way that you generally represent a gravitational wave is by saying we have essentially flat spacetime. But there's some small perturber that comes through, and that small perturbation is the gravitational wave. Is two black holes merging? <laughs> yeah, it's it's the signal from the two black holes right. that have merged far away from us. Okay. So, uh, if you want the la- the layman's term, which is much easier to understand in my opinion, is you can imagine space and time, space time as well. Okay, I'm going to use the trampoline analogy because it's easy and people yeah, use it all the time. Good. Yeah. So you know you can imagine it's like a sheet, like a rubber sheet, right? And if you put an object, a massive object, on that rubber sheet, the sheet bends. Okay. Now, if you if you instead have two massive objects, okay, and you roll them not directly in, at each other, not directly at each other, but like one, both in a clockwise direction or something, right? right? You would get a small orbit. Now, this orbit would decay due to friction, but if you imagine that we were in perfect magical physics land, <laughs> we don't have friction, so right. these would just continue to orbit. Um, but it would also create ripples in the sheet, right? You can think about this in another way, which is if you just take your hand, which is mass, right? You have some mass in your hand and you stick it under water. You shake your hand around under the water, just wiggle it about. You're going to create re- waves on the surface. That's kind of how gravitational waves are produced. Okay. Gravitational waves are produced by an accelerating mass. Okay. So if we were to get up and dance about, we would produce gravitational waves. But they'd be so, so, so small that it doesn't even. They would be matter. incredibly weak. Yeah. With how how small are we talking? Like, 
smaller than the size of an atom or even smaller than that? So the gravitational waves that were detected by LIGO from the merging pair of black holes, yeah. <laughs> uh, the physical size of the wave was one one thousandth the size of a proton. Wow. Really, yeah. really small. That's really small. So like, this is coming from black holes. So yeah. you and me dancing around would just, it would never, ever get picked up. Do the one question um, I had last episode, by the way, verify the only thing we got wrong last episode was where the lo- detectors are located. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm proud right. of that. Take that as a win. <laughs> I, I, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I, I did hear, I did listen to your episode. And yes, the, for, for the record, yes, the LIGO detectors um, are located in Livingston, Louisiana and Hanford, Washington. Thank you. I knew it was in, with an H. I knew it. <laughs> it's, it's okay. It's, it's the world's worst locations to visit on vacation. Um, it's the best location okay. for a physics site. And you don't, you don't, want, you don't want a lot of people People around, right. but uh, L- Livingston, Louisiana, is essentially in the swamp, and uh, Hanford, Washington, is essentially the desert wasteland. So it's not terribly fun to hmm. visit, but they're great for scientific detectors. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Do waves decay? That was my question. Oh wow! Yeah, one in the same. Great minds think alike. So black holes, two black holes merging, mm-hmm. super huge event, causes some detectable gravitational waves yeah they're billions of light years away or whatever it is if we were closer to it would we get a more significant change does anything they they pass through everything so there is there's nothing to make that wave decrease in amplitude brennan you're like excited to yeah. answer it <laughs> yes yes they do, they do decay they as they more. travel okay. they do decay as they travel they have some okay. uh some so gra- the force due to gravity in a Newtonian sense is often called an inverse square law. Yeah. Uh, you talk about yeah. one over R squared. Um, when you talk about electromagnetic radiation, so light propagating to us, that also falls off. That uh, falls off as one on R. Uh, and gravitational radiation also has some one on R behavior fall off. So it's much, it decays much So y- So a signal is weaker the further away it is. So we actually have some detectable sphere that LIGO can see out to kind of thing. It's I'm putting see out to in quotations since you can't right. see my fingers on the podcast. But y- yeah, y- you can see out to this sphere, which means that any any event that happens within this radius, LIGO can detect. Anything that happens outside that radius, the wave has decayed off. The gravitational wave has decayed off to the point where LIGO won't be able to detect it anymore. So, so if a pair of bi- if a pair of binary black holes merged in our solar system, it'd be bad for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, we one. would have yeah we would have bigger problems than the than the gravitational waves given off. Right. <laughs> um, so using the data from the detector, what are we able to uh, do with it? How are we able to apply it? Yeah. Are we able to apply it, or is it too early to tell? What like. What do you mean? Apply? So like right now, we finally detected them. We finally measured these waves and said, yes, they're real. Yes, we can measure them, right. if, however small they are. Is there any way we can use those measurements in order to inform new designs for things or even use the waves themselves in any application that you can see? This is total um, speculation. You don't have to have any evidence to support this. I don't yeah. have any evidence to support anything, I think. No. So. I don't know of any like applications of gravitational waves. I mean, this was like the first direct confirmation of a black hole's existence, which is pretty awesome. Oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. A lot of people, since this worked out so well, are going to use this to advocate for ELISA, which is our space detector we want to put up there. Okay. All right. If you're listening to this and you are independently wealthy, please give us money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of branching off of that, Besides actually looking for gravitational waves, is there a next step or is there more testing that we can do with that? Um, I mean, yeah, we're always working to find better, more accurate, quicker models. And now that we know what to look for, we can improve that? I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, a lot of research goes into like more than just like the computing, like improving the detector itself. Like the hardware yeah, that we use. Yeah, I actually... Um, I toured some labs in Syracuse and got to check out some of like the interferometer technology and they're working to make it more sensitive and that's really cool. I yeah. Think. The more sensitive, the better, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So to, I understand that we are able to conduct uh, simulations of 
black hole uh, gravitational waves, right? Yes. So how hard is it to make those simulations? Ooh, so how hard do the computers have to work? Right. <laughs> yeah, so this is a big problem, and it actually was a huge headache. You may have heard in the news uh, and the RIT bulletins and all that stuff that they say it's they said something along the lines of RIT scientists prove gravitational waves, the, the yeah. waves, that kind of thing. That that isn't true. Uh, we, didn't, okay. we didn't actually do that. Us what credit, we, you guys? We we I will give us credit where credit is due, which is that we um, our research group here was one of the three research groups to break through and be able to fully model binary black hole space times for the first time. Very cool. So in yeah, so this this idea of of doing these mergers on a computer was oof, even thought of back in like I think the seventies. People were thinking about these ideas and how you could possibly do it and maybe with some kind of like time integration. So you step the black holes along in time and you just evolve um, a three dimensional met space as opposed to a fully four dimensional space time. So you split it into one time that you can step along and three I spatial see. dimensions so, that you can solve. Uh, and that that is essentially how we do it. Yeah, I was confused. <laughs> my, my brain is exploding over here. I'm going to pick it up off the floor. But, <laughs> so yeah, what so, are you stepping along in your simulation? So so what you do is you have uh, you, you take the for the full GR equations, and that describes a four dimensional space time. Yeah. Okay. And then we say, okay, well, we can't actually do much with this. <laughs> uh, it's great. It's awesome. But if you want to actually like do something on a computer, a computer can't do that. They're, they're, well, there are 10 partial differential equations that are nonlinear and coupled to one another. I'm, I'm gagging they're, over they're bad. here. They're bad. They're in my head yeah, right now. They're, way, they're, they're bad. You okay. have to solve 10 equations simultaneously that each, that each include second partial derivatives. Yeah. And Sounds it, fun. Yeah. It, 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 as soon as you have will a it, binary, it's impossible. Will to solve. this be on the final? It will not. <laughs> 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 it, it definitely won't be. So this problem was huge, and people were thinking about this even back in the 70s. And then in the 90s, uh, it was the, I think it was the National Science Foundation issued this so-called grand challenge. They said, this problem is really hard, and so we're going to challenge all the scientists to solve it. Go do it. And wow. nobody could do it. For 10 years, nobody could do it. It took until 2005 before people were successfully able to, to merge two black holes on a supercomputer. So today it's become a lot more routine. Um, there are several very, very well-developed methods that we're pretty damn sure work. Um, and just to give like a time, like a time step. So uh, one of the recent simulations that was done in the CCRG uh, was not done by me. It was done by Carlos Lusto and his postdoc, Jim Healy. Uh, they simulated a binary black hole with spin. So you have these, these black holes have angular momentum uh, and they simulated, I think the last 40 orbits or something. So the black holes orbited each other, I think about right. 40 times. Uh, and on the cluster, on the supercomputer running 24 seven, it took six months. Wow. That's less than six seconds of real time. Like, Holy like so they're the, spinning more than 40 rotations over six seconds. The yeah, so so the bo the orbit the black holes are orbiting each other very very fast at this point. And do they get they go faster as they get closer? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, just conservation of angular momentum. And you said that these simulations take how long to compute? Yeah, so something that took nature less than six seconds. To, well, the the signal that we saw was much less than a second. Okay. Wow. wow. And these numerical simulations can take upwards of months. What if you forgot a semicolon in your code. <laughs> Hopefully, if you forgot a semi, yeah, for if you're a bad computer coder and you forgot a semicolon, hopefully it will crap out when it tries to compile. Yeah. So you won't okay. be running it. <laughs> but yes, yes, having the code die on you is a very real concern. Okay. Uh, so what you, if you want, like the the cop out way that we do it is you you write checkpoint files so you don't lose everything. It was like the simulation yeah. was going okay, it was going okay, it was going okay, something went disastrously wrong. You have these checkpoint files that you've kind of backed up so you can restart the simulation not from the start, from yeah. the initial conditions. You can start it at some later time. So this is obviously a huge computing problem, but 
Um, like that's an understatement. But I'm not sure if I'm getting the sense that this is as much of a, um, like an engineering problem, not engineering, like physics, right? You, we, we have had these equations, predictions for this sort of thing for decades, almost a century, right? So is it only computing that's the problem? Or is it that we have to kind of play with these equations enough so that we can make it able to be computed within our technology? It's, it's a lot of both. Like, you want to improve your computational techniques, but you also want to, like, find a way of describing the system that's not ridiculously hard to compute. Right. So have you found... How much do we know about the neutron star equation of state? Oh, uh, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you're developing new ways to describe these other things? Is yeah. That, is that what you meant by the, the Taylor series approximations? You're finding new approximations? So... So like he explained, one way is to take the equation of motion right, and approximate it with a Taylor series. And um, for example, another way that I have been working with is um, you use what's called an effective one body model where you uh, treat it as one body orbiting the other. And it's a, it's a different like description okay. of the motions of the system. I so guess. in a neutron star, it's like, what is the true thing that like you're saying it's a one body problem, but isn't a neutron star one thing? I'm a little confused. So binary neutron stars. Oh, okay. So, so you, you have, have two neutron, like, like binary. So binary they're both stars. orbiting each other around a central, like a center of gravity, but you're modeling it by one orbiting the other. Yeah, you can do that. That is one way you can solve this problem. There okay. are, I mean, there's a couple ways you can go about these problems. Yeah. I'm just curious to know what those yeah. are. <laughs> I mean, there's no like right, right way, I guess. And um, it depends on what you're trying to like extract from. Which, whichever one is most useful, whichever approximation gives yeah. you what you want. Right. Right. Um, I just want to jump back to the supercomputer simulation one more time. It's really fascinating. It's sure. blowing my mind as we make this podcast. But in the simulation, are you able to see what's going to happen? Um, once they merge, are you able to get that far? Oh, are you are you saying after merger, what happens? Right. Yes, we can do that. So wow. what happens after merger is something called ring down. Um, so yeah, so what happens is these black holes are orbiting each other and they're losing energy and they're losing angular momentum and they are losing it to gravitational waves. So you have to conserve, it's still like... Physicists are really, really dead set on this whole idea of energy conservation and momentum conservation. Like, we will never give that up. <laughs> sure. I have yet to find a, a point at which we'll give it up. And there's a reason for that, which is, you know, you need to conserve it. If it goes somewhere, it has to be going somewhere, right? So right. it's losing to gravitational radiation. Gravitational waves are being emitted. It's spiraling in. And then once it merges, okay, once it merges, you have effectively... Well, okay, so I'm going to talk about the binary black hole case. I can let Monica tell you about what happens if you tidally disrupt a neutron star. But um, you have one black hole. You just have a bigger black hole, but you have a black hole that isn't exactly round. So you have a black hole that is still uh, accelerating, okay? So it still gives off gravitational waves. So you get a an oblong shape, if you want to think about it in three dimensions you have an right. oblong shape that just kind of like bounces back and forth and then slowly oscillates down to some central Interesting. solution wow yeah so in the like gra- a bubble that yeah. kind of vibrates itself yeah just like vi- rings it it's called it's called ring down because if, it rings oh yeah, okay. it, it is effectively thinking- like striking a bar you know that oh, that ring there's an oscillation in the bar that rings itself out so is it uh essentially trying to get to some equilibrium yeah yeah, okay. it settles back down to an equilibrium point. Okay. And actually, in which is really cool, in the LIGO data, when when this happened, when we saw this event, you see the ring down too. You see the merger, wow. which is this big spike in the data. It's just really, really obvious. You can see these big spikes in the data, which is the actual merger, the violent merger of gravitational waves. And then you see it just kind of taper off. Boom. And that taper is the black hole ring down. So hmm. when you're looking at data from these simulations is it like what kind of graph is it i've I've seen visualizations that are like color maps and and things where you it looks like a ripple in a pond and um that's kind of like what's 
you know, being the best shared. Way to imagine. Yeah, it's actually your wallpaper, James. Right. Um, <laughs> but you said there's a big spike. So yeah. are you looking at uh, the amplitude of like the warping of space? What are you What are you looking at? What's the metric? So what we're looking at is actually called the strain. And that's in the detector. It's like the fractional change in oh, okay. the length so of these big interferometer. You're arms. simulating what will be measured with the detector. That's yeah. That I mean, I wow, it sounds so obvious now that I put it into words. <laughs> <laughs> so you're measuring this. You keep, yeah, keep it's called that, uh, the strain, and um, okay. we measure strain versus time. And when you plot that, it looks like like a sine wave that's slowly increasing in mm -hmm. amplitude, and then at merger. It, spikes really high and then it sort of dies down interesting you can actually like people have made like sound clips you can listen oh really to. you can listen yeah, to the black hole ringing what awesome. yeah so uh so we we need to is, hear that right now uh oh, yeah. well i can make the sound for you yeah. actually it's pretty easy to make uh so the th this <laughs> this analogy is we don't actually, so we don't actually hear space, of course. Yeah, but sure. For sound waves to travel, you need molecules. Mm -hmm. There's no molecules in space. What but you're gravity hearing is a medium in this sense. Yeah, what, what you're hearing here is what it would, what the gravitational wave frequency would sound like. Now, the reason why this analogy works is because it just so happens that these frequencies are about what we can hear. Oh, they're about a hundred hertz. Oh. 100 a couple hundred hertz okay. so you can you can actually hear this with your and so some somebody so i don't actually have any idea who first started this yeah. practice but somebody somewhere said well we could just take this and turn it into a sound clip because it's the same frequency wow. so i mean if you want to hear what a black hole Let's merger hear sounds hear. like all right it sounds like this it goes doop <laughs> that's, that's it that's it you just you hear wow. it you know it gets higher in pitch it gets louder, it goes do whoop, and it's done. Wow. Yeah. So That's... we call that we call that very uh, aptly the chirp. I'm gonna pause right here and say we actually went back and found the real clip released by LIGO of two black holes merging, and this is what it sounds like. Okay, back to the show. What I'm thinking here is the first thing I thought of was whales. <laughs> space whales, man. Space whales. The whale song. They're communicating through the space-time medium. So what, you think two whales are orbiting each other very, very quick and then merge? <laughs> Have you ever seen a space whale? Have you ever seen a black hole? I don't think so. Come on, think about it. <laughs> but it's a living well, organism. I, the pioneers used to ride these babies for miles. That's a, that's a SpongeBob reference. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. So I I cannot prove you wrong. So yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have no evidence to the contrary. <laughs> oh man. Okay, speaking of kind of the extraordinary, um, after our gravitational waves episode, one of our listeners had a, a follow up question that you guys are like the best people to answer this. But I am more than willing to answer any question. I cannot guarantee the accuracy of my answer, <laughs> and I may make something up. That's, that's but, my life story, bro. <laughs> you just fake it until you make it, right? Yeah, it's my mantra. <laughs> All right. Um, but, Monica, I want to hear your answer to this, too. Okay. So, this question comes to us from our listener, Ramsey. Can you simulate wormholes with your theory? Like, could you simulate a wormhole with your simulations? Okay, yeah, sure. I cool. I don't really know what goes into simulating a wormhole, but So a wormhole would be a jump a, from yeah. connecting space to through outside outside of the plane of existence, right? Connecting something else. Right. It's connecting you're folding it over is the common description. Yeah. And connecting it. So I'm trying to think just like so wormhole solutions are acceptable. Wormhole solutions are yes. acceptable. We did it, James. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, you, you can you can do it. And if you've seen the movie Interstellar, uh, Love it. you'll know that. Yeah, there's there's actually so the guy who uh, was the science advisor on Interstellar, his name is Kip Thorne. Yep. He's uh, yeah, he's, <laughs> a little he's hard quite the, he, he's quite the scientist. Uh, he was actually the one who kind of first proposed wormholes as a possible solution. They do work, I will say. Um, however, 
Now this is a big but. They are unstable to anything. So if you try and put anything through a wormhole, they will collapse. Why is that? Uh, Theoretically. <laughs> so Space whales. <laughs> I don't think so. It's how they so swim. The, um, so black holes are essentially singularities. Right. Right. Mathematically, they're considered singularities. So there's it's just a point in space that has infinite density and a finite mass and no volume. And that is the singularity. OK. Um, but what you don't hear as often is that you can have different kinds of singularities and wormhole solutions are ring singularities. So when you talk about going through a wormhole and going through the throat of the wormhole, you're actually traversing the ring singularity through there. That ring singularity cannot, if anything pulls on that ring singularity even a little bit, even one particle, it is exponentially, um, it will exponentially oscillate. So it, okay. it resonates with everything and will just instantly collapse. So, yes, you can. Are they viable? Probably not. However, I, there are a bunch of really cool and really out there papers theorizing about like, okay, if we had wormholes that you could force open and keep open, what could you do with them? And it gets real wild. That, that actually leads in nicely to my follow-up question to that. Would a greater understanding of gravitational waves and space-time in general bring us closer to warping space-time in a controlled way, whether it means wormholes or not, or just making waves ourselves? Um, and what kind of spaceship would be required to do something like that? Like Spaceship? Okay, so hear me out. Making gravitational waves is hard, right? It, it takes a lot of energy and whatever. If we were to use gravitational waves, like say we had a huge gravitational wave, just, okay, we had it. What kind of energy and what kind of requirements would it take to make such a thing? These are fun questions. Oh. <laughs> so are you, are you just asking? Just make stuff up. Are you, so are you asking about um, how could we use gravitational waves for space travel? Or how could we make a gravitational wave? How do you make one? Okay, well, yeah. yeah, if you want to make a gravitational wave, you need a lot of mass and you need to accelerate it really fast. So you essentially need black holes, yep. which is kind of rough. Or neutron stars, right? Or neutron stars. Okay. Now, if you're asking how could you harness gravitational waves? Yes, both. Well, uh, so, so there's a... The thing that is always driven home is something that says gravity is coupled very weakly to matter that's very good for us and very bad for us so the good thing is that that means gravitational waves pass through everything they don't they don't interact with matter the bad news is that it means that it's really hard to get anything out of the gravitational wave but if we in, had a big enough one in in the future if there was a way to do this if you had some kind of matter that could couple to gravity if you had some well, I hate to invoke quantum quantum mechanics, but you know, if if somehow you had some graviton interaction from some quantum theory of gravity, maybe you know you could you you could potentially use this as something like a light sail, where okay. you just, sail on or surfing, surfing, surfing. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> space whales riding the space whales, oh. and then the space whales <laughs> the space up. whales doesn't make sense, and then if you want <laughs> surfing. Sort of makes sense. It's a gravitational wave. Silver surfer, dude. It's real. Okay. So okay. yeah, there. I mean, Thank because you. there there is a background. There is a background of gravitational waves that is out there that is just left over from all the other interactions. And so, if there was a way you could harness that, then yeah, you could use that to power some kind of ship in some way. Maybe like a light sail. Maybe not like a light sail. Is there, are there energy harvesting um, potential? Is there energy harvesting potential with a? Uh, I mean, it's an oscillatory with an thing. electrodynamic tether. <laughs> so, well, again, again it's it, it is not currently feasible. There's there's no there's no way for us to extract energy from a gravitational wave currently because, well, I'm going to say it again. Gravity couples very weakly to matter, and everything that we have is matter. What about what about in magic? Physics land. <laughs> I mean, in magic physics land, sure. I, the, the amount of energy that you can get out of gravitational waves are huge. So if, like, right now, I mean, this is a kind of stretching it, but Specs is a group where we, we like thinking about where 
space exploration will be in the future. And we're taking baby steps, but we're trying to make a difference. We're trying to have an impact and step toward that future. Right now, we're only working with CubeSats and um, high-altitude balloons and um, yep. control moment gyro is another one of mm-hmm. our projects. And these are small things that could be could develop into huge different things. Yeah, the reason I asked about the electrodynamic tether is because we're developing a project to use an electrodynamic tether to essentially harvest energy oh, cool. um, to power the CubeSat alone with that energy. As propulsion, yeah. Right. And that as well. And that's why I was hoping maybe we could get some yeah. gravitational wave energy or but, prove gravitons, something like that. I don't know. Yeah, but a more, a more grounded question is if I wanted to make this my life purpose, what can I do to work with gravitational waves? Like what is the, is there anything within our reach that is unknown that we can start developing? And that's kind of what you guys are doing. And that's one of the reasons why I, I'm so intrigued by the CCRG is because you're kind of trying to answer these questions. Like, Monica, that's your that's the purpose of your research is to sort of identify and, and figure this stuff out. So yeah. what... It's kind of a really... Uh, is esoteric the right word? Esoteric question? I have no idea what that means, so... That sounds I, like a dinosaur probably. to me. Oh. Um, but it, it's really out there question, but I think a lot of all the people listening to this, and, and including me, want to know how we can how we how can we help what can we think about what can we pursue in order to further this science and this research so what i'd say to that is um we are entering just a very 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 beginning of this right this is the very first time we've ever seen something like that it, it's like and this is something that we humans can't even comprehend because we've always seen light it's like the very first time you've even seen light you couldn't imagine if you just looked up at the sky and saw the sun. You couldn't just immediately from that extrapolate and say, "Oh, that's an electromagnetic wave." We could use EMF to power everything in our life. Like we are, we are at the very, very beginning of this. And well, two things I like to say. First of all, there's well, I heard it a while back, and I'm pretty sure it's from Benjamin Franklin. But I'm I don't like to misquote people, but pretty <laughs> sure Benjamin Franklin once uh, lamented about his uh, contributions to electricity and magnetism. He said, this will never have an impact on modern society. Humanity will never benefit from this research. He essentially was kicking off the start of the industrial revolution with his work in electricity. So we don't really know what we are, what you can get from pure research. Pure research is always valuable because even if you don't get anything directly from it, it will always drive technology in such a way where we say, hey, we need better computers or, you know, hey, I need a way to detect a change that's smaller than the width of a proton. How do you do that? That kind of thing. It it drives this technology, and you also get this fundamental understanding out of it that may or may not be extremely useful. Now, secondly, I'd also like to say, because it's the very first gravitational wave, we also don't know what's out there. What we saw was exactly what we expected to see. Oh, that's like the first time in the history of ever, right? Yeah, Yeah, very cool. we, We pretty much knew... Like, we're going to probably be able to detect binary black holes. We're going to be able to detect binary neutron stars. Like, we're going to see these things. And they're probably going to look like this. And we modeled it. And this is what we need to look for. And then there it is. Yeah, it was was exactly what we expected. Not not exactly. They were more massive than we thought they were going to be. Oh, really? Yeah, Yeah, they were much bigger than we thought they were going to be. The gravitational wave or the black holes? The black holes themselves. Oh, okay. That's even cooler. But, I mean, we expected to see black hole binaries. We expected to see them. We didn't know how often we were going to see them, but we expected to see them. So you don't know what else is out there because we don't know what to, well, again, the listening analogy, you don't know what you're going to listen to. Uh, and I heard a really cool talk um, at a relativity conference actually two years ago now uh, where one of the scientists got up and he said, so I'm going to, I'm going to make an analogy to a jungle. You know, if you're deaf, you've never heard sound before and you got dropped into a jungle, and then they just took the earplugs out, and you could hear for the first time, what would be the first thing that you hear? And the first thing you could hear are the really loud things, right? You'd hear the chirps of, like the screeches of the birds, all those those calls, right? And you can make that analogy, okay, those are the black hole binaries, those are all those chirps that you hear in the night sky. Now, the next thing you hear is kind of like the background of the jungle, all the insects buzzing, all the frogs croaking that just kind of make up this ambiance. 
And you kind of also would expect to hear that, right? And so we're going to hopefully be able to hear that soon as well. We're looking into that's called the stata- stochastic background. St- stochastic. 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 It, okay. It's essentially all of – it's random. It's just oh. a random background that is all the gravitational wave sources that you – that are they're too weak to detect on their own, but they all kind of add up to some low-level buzz. Okay. At first, I thought you said sarcastic background. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm here. Okay. Yeah. Please. So, uh, yeah. And so th- then uh, his his final point is that in the clip, he put a, a little clip of Tarzan going in. And, you know, like you hear the Tarzan, like, little yell as he comes in on a <laughs> vine. And, and he, everybody laughs. And he says, yeah, okay. So that represents, you know, what we don't expect, you know. And that's really what you want to shoot for in science. Because... Because expect finding expect. finding something you don't expect is way cooler than finding something that you do expect. Yeah. And we've done an awful lot to find what we have expected, and we're now just in the beginning of this. And so in the next several years, you might hear something about something we don't expect. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> And um, I can't even begin to comment on what that <laughs> We could talk about this for days. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could just keep coming up with questions. I had a couple of fun ones for the end. Go for it, man. Okay. Out of everything that ever happens in the universe, what's your favorite uh, astrophysical phenomenon? Your favorite one. Whether it be, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Black holes, yeah, they're cool, but space whales are cooler. <laughs> what about supernovas or... That's a tough question. What is, what's your, name your top five, your top three. I'm going to have to think about this. I don't have like a, an immediate answer. Well, I would say type two supernova. What are type two? It's a, okay, well, I should actually let them explain that because they'll definitely get the details more precise. Oh, yeah, I think Brenda, I would you be able to do that? Oh, no, no, no. Go. Yeah. I want to hear your explanation. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as I understand it, uh, the difference between types is the way that supernovas uh, occur. Uh, one is with uh, electron degeneracy and one is where um, just enough enough mass uh, gets compacted to not have enough force pushing against it to keep it in equilibrium so it just explodes. It, am I am I get kind of close that's there? That's about right. Yeah, that, that's called a type. Uh, I think that's a type one A supernova. 1A, right, yeah. and that's that's when you get um, mass accreting onto a white dwarf. Okay, and it accretes onto the white dwarf, and the white dwarf can't hold it together, and so it has this big explosion. And they're very, very, very uh, bright, but they're mm-hmm. also really, really regular, and so we use those actually as standard candles. Oh, oh yeah, so yeah that's can, right. So you, you can, can see what happened okay. like really far away. Yeah. So if you see one of these type one A supernova. You say, I know it's going to be about this bright. Because it only happens at that one. There's a very, cri- yeah, there's a critical threshold. And it at always which, happens at that At threshold. which, if it exceeds this threshold, it's going to explode. Uh, so for me, I I think one of the things, I th- this is just something just random that I think is just really, really weird. Um, it's called common envelope stars. So our sun is big ball of gas and yep. there's a, and it has a core and it has some outer layers and it has a corona and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And there's an envelope, which is what you would call, you know, the spherical sun, right? But the core is really dense and the outer layers are really light. And so there are binary stars out there. I'm not, I actually don't know much about this. I just think it's really cool. There are binary stars out there that are orbiting each other so closely that they're, they're, their envelopes overlap. Oh, that's so So you cool. have a binary cool. star. So you have two cores of a sun orbiting inside the sun. Wow. So if you were on a planet around, it would just look like what? It just looked like one huge sun. And it, it's very violent because you're sloshing all this material right. around and you're th- you might throw stuff out. But yeah, I think it's uh, it's just a cool idea. Can we that possibly really get cool. a simulation from the CCRG on this? Personal uh, requests. <laughs> so if you want a simulation like that, the person to talk to is Dr. Jason Nordhaus. He does stuff similar to this. He does lots of supernova stuff. Okay. But he is always the person who you go to if you see something like, hey, they, they're doing something on on stars. What do you think? Yeah. So... Okay. What about you? I don't know. You were talking about type 1A supernovas earlier. I, I have a very specific background in those because of high school science Olympiad. Cool. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I know a lot about type one and supernova. Well, those are pretty cool. Yeah, would you like to elaborate a little bit? I pretty much covered it. You've got a white dwarf and it's accreting matter from a larger body. And once it reaches a certain um, mass limit, which is called the Chandrasekhar, right. Chandrasekhar, something like that. It's a very. Uh, I've always heard of Chandrasekhar. You yeah. stepped up to the microphone like Chandrasekhar. <laughs> 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 yeah. That might be the wrong pronunciation. Chandra, yeah. It, yeah. It's but a... after that point, it it sort of undergoes like a mini explosion, and then it it keeps undergoing this process. So. Okay. So when it when a type one a occurs and it explodes does the white dwarf stay there and it just like blows everything else or is that white dwarf blown apart into a cloud of stuff what happens to the white dwarf after it explodes it so yeah the white dwarf i know it undergoes like smaller bursts yeah but yeah. after after the the supernova i believe it's it just Explode. Goes off into right. the wispy yeah. nebulas that eventually, gave birth eventually, to our there's no white dwarf left. Right, right. Eventually, it's kind of. I don't know how long that takes exactly, but I don't know. I, oh. I thought that that's the cooler type of supernova. Now, if you see a picture of a supernova, you see all these colors and all these very, very vibrant colors, and I want to know: is it actually like that? I can actually say one thing. I'm not sure if, if you guys want to correct me or take over. When you see pictures like that, especially like um, of other planets and, and things and gaseous clouds, what they do is they give colors to certain wavelengths of light. Um, in, in I'm not sure if it's particular to nebulas, but I know for other things. For example, we can't see x-rays. We can't see radio waves. And so things like that that are outside of our visual spectrum, we'll give them artificial colors and say, okay, x-rays are this shade of blue to this shade of blue. And then you overlap that with um, ultraviolet, infrared, and it makes this really, really pretty image. And okay. they do that with, with um, like, you can find pictures of uh, Mars and things, and it looks bluish and yellowish. And well, no, it actually looks reddish brown, but that's boring. And we want to compare sure. things and see what's around so you say okay things with this composition are blue and they stand out is that is that correct yeah yeah okay that's the false false color and compositions essentially makes them prettier <laughs> yeah, yeah there's some cool pictures of the sun too that you can look up that's essentially where they overlap the sun because the sun emits all sorts of radiation so you get x-rays you get uh, i don't think the sun does not emit a gamma rays but you get x-rays you get uv you get optical you get mid ir far ir and you can just take all that and you can just map it to essentially a color and okay and that's not to say the visible spectrum isn't beautiful because it is <laughs> oh okay. um, all right but a lot like so you just kind of have to pay attention the the my opinion the best ones are the overlapping ones for sure so my i, I never i was listening to all you guys i forgot to think of my own i would say that my favorite phenomenon would be when a, a giant star, when the process of collapsing into a neutron star, because this is, this is you, Monica. Um, this is like your jam, right? Sort of. Sort of. My understanding of it is that you have a really, really massive thing. And like we said before, with the Chandrasekhar limit, with the limit, um, you have the pressure pushing outward on a star, gravity pulling it back in, and then as there's more and more mass, it pushes down harder and harder toward the center. And then after a while, it crumples, like if you put a vacuum on a, on a can of soda sort of thing. And then it does that multiple times, right? And the neutron star is as compressed and as compact as you can get it. Yeah, you can't, you can't get more compact than a ball of neutrons. Yeah, basically. it's like a liquid, but, neut but that nuclei of atoms, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's sort of what goes on. Um, it's like soup, <laughs> but it's like liquid star. It, it yeah. just, it's just so mysterious. You know, I heard and that exotic. a neutron star could actually fit in an ocean. It's just so small. They're they can be pretty small. It's one of the problems is like constraining 
the mass and radius of neutron stars, we don't really have like a hard limit or a very like clear idea of what that relationship is. That was what he was talking about earlier, the equation of state of neutron stars. We don't know that for sure. What, what are the types of sizes that you that you guess? Um, so it's a range from I think one point three to like three solar masses. In the size of smaller than the Earth? The radius, we, we don't really know like what the radius range is. I think it's, I want to say it's 15, yeah, it's smaller than the Earth. But the, the number that I keep in my head, which may be very wrong now, but the, the one that I was told a while back that I've just always held on to is 10 kilometer radius. That's yeah, what I was, was going to say 10 to 15, but I, this, so the, they're tiny. A math, well, yeah, tiny taking the sun yep. and massive. down and sinking in the ocean, but there's it, all that mass is still there. A, a neutron star could fit on Manhattan Island. That's how, <laughs> that's how small it is. That was, that's one of my that right behind space whales. That's my favorite astrophysical. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna drive this joke home. Space whales, like, okay, how um, do they move? And of course, so yeah. we uh, we're we're touting neutron stars a lot, and so it's we don't know anything about them as it turns out. Uh, and we're really bad at guessing. So if you want to research neutron stars, that is a really really active area, and uh, if you think they're cool, you can definitely make a career out of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I've got my life plan. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I'll, I'll look for you on the, on the archive. All right. Sounds good. Okay. I had a few more questions about the CCRG in general, but I'm going to skip a couple. Um, well, unless they're interesting. Uh, what are some limitations to the CCRG's capabilities? Like, where, where are your limits, and what would be needed to overcome those limits right now? Okay, skip. <laughs> yeah, uh, administrative question, and uh, the answer can pretty much be summed up in one word, which is money. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, the ideas are not the limit. We, we we have so many ideas and so many ideas for cool things that people can do, and so many the, the professors are always really excited to like try out new things and get people involved in that kind of thing. And I think the main thing is just that, without getting too political. Uh, the, the main limitation is just that we don't have the money to hire people. You know, we don't have the money to hire people. We don't have the resources to, you know, you know, you could say, oh, well, if we had a bigger computer, we could do more. And that answer is yes. But uh, honestly, it just it just comes down to that. OK. Um, and our listener, Drew, he's actually a member of Specs. He has a qu he has a question for you guys. And that's what's the future of the CCRG? And has your mission changed after proving um, the existence of gravitational waves? and uh, the, with the current popular interest around the field um, and like all this exposure, have your goals changed at all? Or are you just like, hey, yeah, now all you guys know we're here and we're gonna keep doing our thing if you wanna help out? Yeah, that, basically, we'd love more people. Like Brennan said, people are a resource we need. <laughs> All right. <That's, laughs> last episode, I was talking about people as a resource for asteroid mining, but I think oh. this is a difference. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's I, just to just to like make sure that you're not glorifying research. You do a lot of grunt work. Yeah. You still do do a lot of grunt work. A lot of it is still, you know, look at this data and plot it 18 million ways. But that's but, necessary in order to see the right, right. thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's necessary. But yeah, there's, there's, it's not, it's not all high minded, like lab codes. intellectuals. <laughs> yeah, you're not sitting in your, in your reclining chair with your pipe and your coffee in the morning and discussing philosophy. Like, it's not that. <laughs> and then it kind of makes your, all your research that you've done already all that more um, valuable, I guess. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to keep on doing what we do and we're glad that people are noticing us now yeah. and uh, all the stuff that we keep, are doing now, we're going to keep doing into the future and this will hopefully generate a lot of interest, which will make um, the future of relativity really bright. Yeah. Well, you've definitely got my interest. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to say the same thing. Thanks yeah. a lot, you guys, for coming on the show and talking about this. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. So thanks for listening. We'll be back in a week or two with another discussion on space exploration, science, and technology. If you have your own questions for Brennan or Monica or requests for other discussion topics, 
send an email to specscast at gmail.com. If you want to hear more, consider subscribing to us on iTunes or your favorite podcasting app. All the past episodes are available to download from our website. This podcast is made possible by RIT Specs, a space exploration student faculty research organization at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Special thanks to the Interactive Learning Grant Program for giving us the tools to promote student and faculty engagement outside of the classroom. And a special thanks to our friends on the subreddit rspacex and Kerbal Space Program podcast, KerbalCast. Our music credit goes to Kevin Hartnell. This has been SpexCast. We'll see you next week.